So I start up this uh, think China Thinkers Bureau. It's a Chinese version of a Speakers Bureau, but uh, we provide uh, advanced service like um, identifying the best thinkers, bring them to China, finding the best client to host them, provide them with decent pay from 10K to 100K US dollars. And uh, of course, uh, we help them to localize them. Because we've been working with like 500 or 300 best China local partners and clients, so we are able to find each Western thinker a great host to disseminate their ideas, philosophies, their love, and uh, their experience in China. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? Five, four, three, two, one. Ni hao everyone, welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still on site in the beautiful Beijing, China. We are now gonna be talking about bringing the world's top thinkers to China. We have Dawei Li joining us on the show. Hi, Dawei. Thank you, Alan. Thank you for bringing me here. Thank you so much for coming on our show. I'm so pumped for our conversation. I'm very grateful to Jingxia for introducing us too. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know Dawei's background, he's the CEO of Tashanshi, AKA China Thinkers Bureau, which is bringing the world's top minds to China for collaboration. And you can find the links in the bio below tashanshi.net, also chinathinkersbureau.com, and a really great piece that was published on them in All Tech Asia. Okay, Dawei, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? <laughs> uh, the direction of our world. Ah. So talking about direction, we need to have a director, right? And uh, the direction of our world, uh, let's think broadly, we are getting much, much nicer and a better livelihood compared with like even 10 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, nearly to 6,000 years ago. We have much advanced technology. Some of the technology has dark side, but most of the technology is improving our uh, life standard. And of course, we are uh, solving the most urgent social problems like 20, 30 years ago we faced, like um, uh, the labor issues, like the productivity challenges, like uh, I believe the world is solving the pollutions. Uh, China's, you can say Beijing's air is much greater than five years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, to sum up, I think our world is uh, directing to a much greater, better directions. That's my first uh, response to your question. Of course, every moon has its dark side. So uh, in China, we often uh, have a great saying that uh, our future is brilliant, but the path to the future is uh, challenging. Uh, it's not easy. So it requires um, manpower, requires our collective uh, efforts. So China and US and any other species and any other nationalities should work together and uh, marching on this uh, road to a much better future. So that's the direction. Yes, okay, so we have uh, increasing flourishing that's happening over time mm -hmm. and it's very evident with people getting themselves out of poverty, getting access to the cutting edge technologies, getting access to the, the information um, economies, getting access to healthcare, it's all this type of stuff. Also, you say that there is this dark side that we have to be careful of mm -hmm. and this is challenging. The road is challenging and mm -hmm. we have, we're trying to grow the tree out of the planet, birth from this yoke of earth with uh, as little suffering as possible and as maximized flourishing as possible. Mm -hmm. What would you say is a key principle that we need to embody to make sure that we stay on this light side more and away from this dark side as we build all these technologies? Key principles, of course, yeah. So I believe uh, Steve Jobs has a very good metaphor, so the crossroad of liberal arts and the technology. I believe technology would inspire liberal arts, but liberal arts, um, in other words, like philosophy, means the love of life or the love of truth should be directing the technology, not the other way around. So we need to find out what's the real question, what's the real challenge. 
before we develop a very advanced technology. So pretty simple explanation is we have a great scientist, we have a great venture capitalist, we have a great ecosystem in Silicon Valley and of course in here in Beijing, in Haidian, in Zhongguanzun. But um, before all the great things happen, we should have a, a philosophy which, uh, which indicate the bright future of where are we going. So I think the, uh, the principle, back to your question, is we need a, a loving, caring philosophy to direct all the development of technology and the flow of capital. So that's my answer. Mm -hmm. Good philosophy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Agreed. This most fundamental first principled question, mm -hmm. what is the ultimate nature of our reality? What is the point of this human experiment, the point of this, and how can we bring our full selves forward into the world, our full gifts forward into the world? And how do we build technology that has love embedded within it, that has a positive trajectory embedded within it, mm -hmm. um, and doesn't leave it open to malicious players mm -hmm. and malevolent actors, that type of stuff. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Dawei, let's talk about who you were growing up. Mm -hmm. and how you got interested in what you care about today. Mm -hmm. Where were you born? Tell us about your journey. Yeah, I, uh, I was, I'm a great example of how globalization, education, technology would change someone's life. So I was born in the Inner Mongolian, a very remote place in China. So that's like 40 years ago. So 40, yeah, I'm a 40, 40 years old today, uh, this year. So. Back that time, China, my hometown, Chifeng City, is a very remote place uh, compared with Beijing. But uh, I've been, my father provided me a key to the library, so I read a lot. Even if today, so uh, China and uh, Beijing and uh, Silicon Valley is much advanced place compared with my hometown today. But I read the same book like uh, the people in their 40s in Silicon Valley. And I read similar books like the people growing up in an advanced city, huge city like Beijing. So I believe knowledge is one of my first stepping stone. Then when I'm in my 20 something, my father provided me a, a opportunity to study abroad. So I've been to Britain, UK uh, for like 10 years study. Then that experience makes me a very internationalized, globalized thinker, people. And gradually, I back to China like 10 or, 20, uh, 10 or fi uh, 15 years ago. I back to China after my study in Britain. So I joined, I proudly joined a very good organization called Caixin Media. And uh, of course, I working at a DRC. Uh, it's a research think tank under state council with the top people of China, the best economists, policy makers of China. So they gradually tell me the, what's the real, what's it happening in China? And what's the difference between China and uh, uh, Western philosophy and the theories? So I have a good experience and study in Western world. And I have a good knowledge and grasp in China. So I'm able to combine those together to start my entrepreneurship like three years ago. Uh, three years ago, I found out that uh, Western thinkers, great thinkers, have a market in China, which means they could sell their not only books, but of course ideas speeches, uh, speech, and product, and uh, company, whatever, in China. So I start up this uh, think China Thinkers Bureau. It's a Chinese version of a speakers bureau, but uh, we provide advanced service, like um, identifying the best thinkers, bring them to China, finding the best client to host them, provide them with decent pay from 10K to 100K US dollars, and uh, of course, um, we help them to localize them. Because we've been working with like 500 or 300 best China local partners and clients, so we are able to find each Western thinker a great host to disseminate their ideas, philosophies, their love, and uh, their experience in China. So that is my life journey. But I want to mention something to you before I ended it up this. In each period of time of my life, I used to have an idol or example or someone to learn from. This year, in 2018, I learned from great Chris Evans, the actor of uh, Captain America. 
So I learned how to go to gym with him, uh, like him, and I build up my body like him. If you see my picture five years ago, I was a totally fat, bald, uh, glass-wearing, middle-aged loser. But now I'm, I'm gradually uh, went to gym and make myself look like a Captain America. And also I love the patriotic spirit, the caring spirit, the leadership from him. So make me a better entrepreneurship. So that's my story. This is such a beautiful story. Okay, so from Inner Mongolia, you had the access to the library when you were young. You had this drive to read. Mm -hmm. You had um, your father had decided to help provide you with an opportunity to go study in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so then you go at around 15 age? Uh, no, 18. 18. 18. You went yeah. at 18 and you came back when you were about 28 then. Uh, 28 something, yeah. 28, okay. Mm -hmm. So you were there 10 years, yeah, studying mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. So you get more deeply immersed in a, in a globalization, like you mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. and which is actually really interesting because it gives you a really unique lens on the world growing up in different cultures mm -hmm. and then seeing what it's like because London's a very big melting pot of different cultures. Mm -hmm. So you get access to that and you get access to Beijing and growing and coming back here and, and being able to do business here. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting like this helps your world view advance and become more robust and well-rounded. Mm -hmm. So then when you come back here, it's working with a lot of the top uh, economists and thinkers in mm -hmm. China mm -hmm. and identifying what uh, policies are different from in China compared to like the Western world and seeing those differences. Mm -hmm. um, and some similarities and what uh, could be uh, uh, advance the um, the, the, the Thinkers Bureau worked directly with advancing actual policy in China. So is that, yeah? No, not no. policy-wise. Okay. It's uh, I'm working with the business world only. Okay, so it would be advancing business uh, success in Practice China. Practice in China, yeah. Business practices. <clears throat> so then, what would be some of the things, let's take it here, we'll start with this and then we'll get to the um, China Thinkers Bureau. So. What would be some of those best business practices that you were um, working on with the think tank that would advance the Chinese businesses? Uh, one good example is I'm uh, so honored and lucky to work with uh, Dr. Mr. Piero Scruffi, the author of uh, Short History of Silicon Valley and many other like 100 books. So he's a great thinker. He knows everything in Silicon Valley. He knows all the great restaurants in Silicon Valley, although he's a vegetarian. Uh, so like five years ago, China, each town of China, like 200 towns, trying to become the local version of Silicon Valley. So they, everybody wants to become a Silicon Valley, but they don't know how to do it, how to become a real Silicon Valley. He thinks, oh, let's build up a, bring a great uh, university, so it could be our Stanford. Or oh, let's bring like 200 VC capitalists, venture capitalists, so they could be our Sequoia. But in fact, that's not real Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is based on the ecosystem. So I'm honored and lucky to work with Mr. Pierre Scruffy, bring him to China to speak at uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, Ningbo, Hangzhou, Chengdu, Wuhan, like 20 top cities to tell the local people what that real Silicon Valley is. How can we build up your local version of Silicon Valley? So gradually, after three, four years, so all the Chinese people, especially the decision maker, the business persons, knows what is Silicon Valley, how to build up their own Silicon Valley, and how to how not to become a just duplication, stupid uh, copycat of a Silicon Valley. So I believe that helps a lot for local cities developers to become a better version of themselves rather than a better duplicate of uh, Silicon Valley. I think that is a good example. Also, I'm honored to work with um, uh, Dr. Mr. Uh, Dick Foster, Richard Foster, a innovation guru. He used to study uh, working in M McKinsey for like 35 years. He is a, a global authority of innovation. So China has been enhancing this innovation entrepreneurship national policy for six years, since 2013. But uh, very little people know what, how can innovation help a nation. Innovation, we think it's uh, about movie, making up movie or making up a new dish, uh, cuisine. But how innovation help our business, our national competitiveness. 
So I bring, I was lucky to work with a doctor, uh, Richard Foster, bring him to China to talk, to speak, to all the decision makers, maybe five or six, the provincial governors, deputy governors, city mayors, and reprint his uh, 1986 classic book, Innovation the Attacker's Advantage in China, sell like 10,000 copies, and uh, ask him to write up columns teaching people how to use innovation as a business uh, weapon. So, by working with uh, Mr. Dick Foster, Chinese society should improve their ability to innovate a little bit, at least 101%, I believe. So, those are two examples, working with Silicon Valley people, working with innovation gurus, helping Chinese business and uh, economic people to improve their ability. So that is one of Two of 200 cases I've been yeah. working on. There's a really clear uh, practice that you use. The practice is that you identify uh, top world strategies for innovation and growth, and then you uh, find them and you invite them to, to come and, and teach. And I really like how uh, you talk about how it's about having an ecosystem that's thriving like what Silicon Valley had and also like about having these different ideas for um, recipes for innovation and growth and then being able to take those and spread them around the top Chinese cities and then have them actually get implemented into business practices as soon as possible. This is great. So, okay, so then about three years ago you decided that you wanted to start Tashanshi China Thinkers Bureau and you have now these speakers coming and they get like 10,000 to 100,000 US dollars. They're coming to China, they're going on speaking tours, they have really good hosts, really good immersion into culture, build really good networks and collaboration. Um, so there's like a long-term collaboration happening between some of the ideas that they have and some of the ways they can be implemented in China. Is that about right? Yeah, sure. Okay, and then now like walk us through then, um, is, is, is the example that you gave where uh, someone's coming and they're going on a tour across the major Chinese cities and speaking to you know maybe hundreds of people at a time about uh, the ideas and about how to implement them is that generally what um, China Thinkers Bureau is doing primarily? Yeah, uh, in addition to all the uh, business oriented people as I mentioned I also so proud to work with like 20 Nobel laureates bring them to speak uh, economics and uh, innovation educations as well. Okay, so also Nobel laureates coming across different uh, sciences and innovations, educations, and so then they come and teach as well. So it's both uh, like authors, leading thinkers, uh, corporate uh, owners, as well as Nobel laureates are coming here and doing these, it's mostly like speaking tours across China is that speaking tours and collaborations with the local leaders in those areas. Yeah. To advance business policies. It is true, yeah. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. cool, cool. Now, um, let's take us through an idea of what you foresee being like the best model for this because we have, um, we have, you know, the United States and China is so important for the two to collaborate and work more harmoniously together moving forward. We have many of the other world leading economies that we also want to, in a sense, we want to help take good ideas from them and implement them in our countries to have good ideas from us get exported to their countries. How do we best make a global collaborative social fabric more effective? Mm. That's a beautiful question. Ah, firstly, um, <coughs> I'm questioning this question, why should we have a globalized fabric society? We don't have to. So China has their own requirement and want. So you see, the top 10 global thinkers in China maybe are not top 10 global thinkers in states. Maybe there is only one same person like Yuval Harari. He is uh, like top 10 thinkers in states and top 10 thinkers in China. But the rest now are different. So we do not have to have a unified fabric, fabric society. That's my answer to your question, my challenge to your question. But also, I believe there are a few approaches that are great. One is the global summit and uh, conferences like Davos. 
Each year, there are four, five thousand people meet at Davos, attending hundred events, conferences, exchange their ideas, making connections. That's one thing good. And I know there are many other great events like the like TED, TED event, like the Burning Man, like the Thousand by Thought. Those kind of conferences, the physical uh, meetings provided to the people from different world would definitely improve their understanding of each other. That's number one. Number two, I guess that's also the future, especially the young people, like in their teenagers, 20 years old people, are get used to working on an online society. So we have uh, like Weixin, Weibo, it's the Chinese version of Twitter. But let's think about it, maybe in the long term from now, the future, there is the technology could uh, uh, combine Twitter and Weibo together. So the people in Weibo would see what happened in Twitter. Twitter would see Weibo. I mean, all the technology platforms, if they work together, would provide a huge uh, virtual reality for the, the real people, improve their understanding, and uh, improve their uh, beliefs, and uh, uh, would uh, probably help in the harmonious society, as you mentioned. So physical meetings and uh, technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, coming back to the very first thing you were saying, um, there may have been like a miscommunication with the way that I said the question or something, just because um, the way you answered it is actually in the way that I was thinking about it as well, which is that you have different world leaders, world thinkers in China versus Saudi Arabia versus Russia versus Korea versus United States, blah, blah, blah. And so ideally what I was thinking is it would be great to see if there was a way to take the ones in the US and bring them to Brazil or Korea or whatever and have the ones in Portugal and South Africa go to China or go to uh, what other, what, Thailand, whatever other countries around the world, basically make a greater social fabric around exchanging world top thinkers and ideas and then having them go and speak and share so that it can advance business practices and advance that type of stuff. And it seemed like that was kind of also something that, that you were feeling when you were answering the question. Mm -hmm. So. So seeing how we can maximally get there fast is great. I actually also really liked what you said about Weibo and Twitter because um, it, it, in a sense, it's like, how do you connect like a billion people here with a billion people here that are using a very similar um, social media communication platform, but that currently can't talk to each other across that social media gap. And so that's also kind of like WeChat and WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or whatever you want to say. So I also really like that one too because uh, there seems to be a serious amount of, 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 of hindrance of creative uh, endeavoring when I uh, can't as easily communicate, I can't as easily share, I can't as easily co-create with someone else because of this gap between the platforms. So how can we, I, in a sense, take the silos that are the platforms and make some sort of a communicative fabric across them so we can become more creative together? This is a very big question. and. You brought this up, so I want to I wanna ask it. Um, do you feel like the uh, role of uh, exponential technologies, you mentioned something like a virtual reality, you know, a lot of people from around the world starting to be location agnostic, meaning they don't need to be strapped into being in, in, in Beijing, being in their office, but they can work from home, they can go work from somewhere else in the world, et cetera. They can just go into the VR environment and work with other people from around the world, from their home, et cetera. You know, that being one of many, there's so many other things about genetically engineering away diseases and genetically augmenting ourselves or using neurotechnology to augment ourselves. Um, there's so many of these up and coming ways that are uh, quantum computing being unleashed into the world. So with given all these uh, exponential technologies and given um, our, our, our mutual desire to uh, uh, to take the best practices from around the world and bring them forth into uh, all of the different countries' practices. What would you say then is a way that the those exponential technologies that we listed earlier, plus the 
sharing ideas around the world, how can those two things synchronize and interplay most effectively? Oh, synchronize and uh, mutual play. Technology and uh, I think very little about that uh, because uh, probably those are the ideas only generated from the smart people from Silicon Valley. I believe the 99% of the people around the world do, do not think about a question like that, a connectivity or whatever. They only think about how this technology or this new app would improve my business or help me to get more food and uh, higher salary. So that is a question very ad avant-garde, very advanced, but uh, doesn't solve the real challenge and issue of our society. The real challenge and issue are the lower productivity, lower wages, uh, heavy, heavy loaded works. And uh, like uh, in China, the 99%, uh, not China, I mean globalized speaking, 90% of people do not have the access to AI technology and they don't have to, they don't need that. So my point is your question is a great one, but I don't have the answer. But uh, comments on your question is that it is uh, uh, it's not very uh, it's not very important question for now. It's a elite question. So the real challenge for ninety percent of uh, world population is how can they use technology to improve their work life and maybe living standard. Interesting. So all of those exponential technologies that we listed do exactly that. They mm -hmm. help take people out of poverty, they help give them access to more money, more food, more water, more shelter, all these basic needs, healthcare, etc. So the democratization of those technologies could be one of those business practices we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. where people can more effectively distribute the technology to more people faster and take them out of poverty, increase their living standards, etc. So even though the question itself may seem like in a way it's like uh, elite in a sense, at the same time, the practices that can be implemented from the distribution and the dissemination of the technologies and democratization of them is exactly what gives 90% of the world the advancement of money, of getting out of poverty, getting more health care, that type of stuff. So that's kind of why I guess I asked the question is like, what best business practices can help take the cutting edge technologies and disseminate them, democratize them to more people around the world to get them out of poverty faster and get them advanced faster? I think uh, this is a very complicated question. And uh, instead of um, I'm ans giving you a very complicated answer, we can look at uh, several great practice, great examples. Why don't you show me? You know, Steve Jobs invented this beautiful iPhone like 10 years ago. It's beautiful. But their productivity only can provide like 1% of the very rich uh, people around the world to use the iPhone. The iPod is very expensive iPhone, but uh, Xiaomi invented a similar quality phones, and of course Huawei and uh, some of the Chinese mobile producer manufacturer can provide the least developed people, the the, the 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 poorest people in China, or see very underdeveloped nations like the African countries to use the similar phones like the Silicon Valley people using, with ten percent of their price. So my point is Xiaomi and Huawei are doing a great job by disseminating the advanced technology to a poor people, larger populations. So we should, uh, instead of giving a brief answer, we should look at what Xiaomi is doing. I believe that is a great democratization of technology. Mm -hmm. Instead of going on the street, teaching people what does AI mean, what is the challenge, what the ethnic issues of AI, we could uh, we could use some hundred, no, twenty dollars by two smart speaker. It's uh, the cheapest AI terminal anywhere in the world. It's a Baidu speaker. Mm -hmm. Just give to a very poor people. Ask them, uh, tell them, you can ask weather. You can ask everything from this speaker. If you are feel, feeling lonely and bored, you can ask the speaker play music and uh, standing comedians and uh, whatever to you. It only costs you like one cents per day, so it's nearly nothing. So instead of disseminating all the sophisticated philosophies, which Silicon Valley people love to do, 
We just provide a very cheap things to the poor people. Yeah. That is better approach, I guess. This is a really good example. Okay, such a good answer. Okay, so we have um, uh, so many things that Silicon Valley is doing, and I'm actually deeply critical of this as well, because a lot of what the technologies that are being made out there are for the 1% of people that can afford a $1,000 plus dollar phone or a $2,000 plus dollar computer or want some sort of a way to augment you know, their $50,000 Tesla or their, uh, their, their, their augmenting incrementally uh, instead of doing something like, you gave this example with Xiaomi, where they're doing something like uh, making the, their, their their hardware is com in co in it, it's compatible it's it's about it's at the it's at a very close level of competition sophistication with a behemoth like Apple selling it at a fraction of the price to enable uh, people in China uh, and other developing parts of the world to gain access to information technology being democratized at their fingertips for less money. Excellent. Another great example, the Baidu speaker. We obviously have our uh, Amazon and Google Alexa. and Apple ones as well. Yeah, we have our speakers as well. And Okay, so you take this Baidu speaker and you called it an AI terminal. I love that, right? So instead of going around and being like, and being around, hey, hey, people around the world, you should care about AI ethics, and you know, and l people that are literally just trying to incrementally improve their life have to now become leading AI ethicists and philosophers, um, versus giving them a Baidu speaker and giving that AI terminal, like you said, ask about the weather, ask about education stuff, ask to enhance your mood, ask to all this type of stuff, play music, play games with friends, blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden that person is becoming more and more tied into what natural language processing is, what, how that object is working with, with the cloud computation, how that object is able to, on demand, do what I ask it to do. And so I think that becoming democratized is actually a great way to get more people to at eventually end up caring more about AI and to care more about technology um, through their everyday use rather than having some sort of a highly sophisticated philosopher that's telling them about AI ethics. So I think that's a really good um, answer and example. So it could then be that some of the best business practices are to figure out how to enhance the life of average people around the world mm -hmm. incrementally through mm -hmm. education, through healthcare, through technology, through science, mm -hmm. through art, these types of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my point of view. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, let's play on this a little bit more then. So how does a, a China Thinkers Bureau, how, mm -hmm. how do you envision the, what we just said? How do you envision thinkers coming from around the world to China and helping the different areas incrementally improve these different cities, incrementally improve the living standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, we are living in a globalized society. So not only Beijing, there are two, one, 199 other cities in China as well. You basically have 200 cities. Some cities are very globalized, very well informed. Some, some cities or see some companies or some people need to learn what is happening outside of my city and uh, what is the best practice in Beijing, in Shenzhen, in Silicon Valley, in New York. So what I'm happy is a brokerage of uh, talents and knowledge. Bring those people to those least, less developed cities, like another 199 cities to talk, to pitch to preach, I mean, uh, what is happening in Silicon Valley, in New York, in Beijing, in Shenzhen. So they, 
they might, they might not to uh, start to learning from or listening from the speaker. But at least uh, it's a good reminder to them what is happening now. Helping them to increase their efficiency and effectiveness and uh, with lower budget, with lower cost. That would help not only the cities in China, but the overall benefit of the globalized society. For example, if everybody in China, we have 1.5 billion Chinese people, maybe 1,000 people five years ago, 1,000 people knowing what is the real Silicon Valley. So if you are from Silicon Valley, come to the rest of China. People think you are strange. But after Mr. Pierre Scruffy giving talks in China, maybe there are too many people understand what is happening in Silicon Valley. So if you meet him with those, one of those 200, 2 million people, you will have a common knowledge, a common understanding. So that's in, improve the efficiency of international cooperation and decrease the possibility of conflicts. So in the future, my vision of the future is I bring maybe 100, 200 great thinkers, speakers from Silicon Valley, from European countries, from Israel, from Japan, come to talk to China. And I will bring another maybe 200 Chinese smart people to talk in different countries. I love it. Will help uh, their understanding of each other. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I love this vision. This is very aligned with what we care about with our show. It's why we're here in China right now, mm -hmm. showcasing some of the greatest minds here. Mm -hmm. And so if we can um, do a deeper collaboration where we can help funnel some of the smartest minds into what you're doing, mm -hmm. and if you guys uh, come funnel some of the smartest minds onto the show, that could be super interesting. and. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting alignment with, with our uh, passion. I like that. I like mm -hmm. that. What about um, this? Is a very um, this is a, this is a, I love this vision. I'm just I'm a huge huge fan of of of, of this vision. It's very geopolitical. Um, it's very um, it's very focused on on best practices. You like identify what's best around the world from different thinkers, and you try and bring that around the world to different cities and to different business strategies around the world. It saves money. It increases people's uh, health and education, and it's just it's a no brainer. And it's a good one. I like it. I like it. It's an easy one. Um, the challenge is how to best get there, but it's a no brainer vision. The vision is e is easy, uh, really important. Okay, let's ask um, about uh, some of these more, uh, uh, these questions that are a little bit, like you mentioned earlier, like we, don't, we sometimes forget to ask the really big questions. And sometimes the really big questions can get young kids to want to do something besides just uh, be in their like little like bubble of their like community, but like go out and try and ch tackle one of the big world challenges, like a sustainable development goal or something. Which you also mentioned earlier about China's push for sustainability and all this type of stuff. So, okay, so let's talk about exactly that. This ultimate question mm -hmm. of what is the point of the human experience? What's the point of us? evolving on this planet, orbiting the star. What's the point? What's the meaning of this? <laughs> I cannot give you a direct answer, but I can teach someone how to solve this issue. <laughs> so the political correct answer would be improve the others' awareness, helping our poor brothers, sisters, and uh, in fact, this is a past uh, basket, bucket. Ask them to think about this question. The meaning of life. Uh, is that your question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My favorite brand, uh, a band called Backstreet Boys, uh -huh. they have a similar song. Show me the meaning of being lonely. We can change that on show me the meaning of being human, right? Uh huh. Yeah. So. If there is a political correctness, answer is the meaning of life is improve the overall grid of our human society, helping the other peoples to improve their livelihood. That's why you are here in this world. That's the 
That's Captain America's answer. But my answer is, I don't know. I have to keep on living. Probably the answer is、uh, an act rather than a phrase or、um, a paragraph.、Yeah. Keep living. Do not settle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that one. Improving other people's living standards around the world. I like that.、Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Continuing. That's good. Yeah, I like that. It's a.、Uh, it it is it's it both、um, helps ourselves、um, find <clears throat> something that gives us passion to wake up in the morning with, and it also gets other people around the world living better. It's really good.、Mm -hmm. um, You mentioned this earlier. I think it's important to come back to this idea that you had about five years ago a little bit less healthy. You were a little bit less healthy. You、uh, started picking up some better health habits, some better exercise habits,、um, this type of stuff. I think a lot of people around the world are are wondering, you know, how can I become healthier? What were the key things that you decided to do to motivate yourself、um, into、uh, and create habits into creating a healthier Dawei? I think from、uh, thanks to American culture, I, I watched this movie Avengers and Captain America. Maybe only the the teenagers boys in states watching that movie, but people like me in China, I was crying, totally worshiping their histo、uh, heroic、uh, act. So I want to become him exactly like Captain America, a tall, handsome, strong, athletic, no glass, more hairs, and、uh, helping the endangered nation. Of course, as well. So I learn a lot from him. So that is the motivation to make me have a healthier life, to be more energetic,、uh, to giving a, a better endeavors to the society. So. And then, what were some of the habits that you started doing? Yeah, I went to gym more often, and I hire a private trainer, and I eat healthier, sleep earlier. And I go to yoga classes as well. Play tennis, go and swim, basketball, squash, <laughs> all the sports. Yeah. So sports make you、uh, smarter. Yes. I guess. Yeah. Yes. More energetic. Yes. Yes.、Mm -hmm. So, so to answer your question, a better,、uh, I mean, advantage、uh, the culture advantage advantage is culture. Would attract people from different culture to study from him, them. So my culture doesn't have a, a spirit of people to go sports. In Chinese traditional culture, a gentleman should、uh, do less sports. Probably just、uh, maintain meditation, or maintain study life like a real gentleman. But a、uh, Western culture, the athletic culture, the Greek culture,、uh, encourage people to fight. To work out, I believe that is great. That's that's much more constructive than any other ideologies from Western world. I mean, living habit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. That's a really powerful one. Is this push to basically、uh, the aesthetics, the、mm -hmm. aesthetics of the human, like get your body looking. Pristinely, like you know, that's yeah, that's a very、like、beautiful、you. thing. I am not pristine.、Yeah, I have, I have you, you too, brother. You look really good. I love it. I love it. And like you know, being forty, like that's what's up. Like yeah, you're doing really well. I like that a lot. Okay, and then how about?、Um, As we go into the exponential technology age, young children now have their whole lives on the devices. Their、mm -hmm. entire life, they don't know what life is like without the phones and computers.、Um, what is a skill that you think that young people should know going into the future? The skill to go into the future, I believe,、um, Chinese people, young people, like critical thinking is important. Critical thinking, yeah, and、uh, thinking and looking. Outside of the box is important. If you do not looking outside of the box, how can you think outside of the box? The people, if they are using their mobile phones, their tendency, they only watching the information the technology provided. They they want to show them. They miss the real、uh, the real world. So they should go in out,、uh, reading more books, meeting more people, traveling a lot, go to the place have no signals or go to the place your mobile phone easily to be stolen. <laughs> 
so you can go to the real world, meeting real people. China itself and the U.S. itself is already a very diversified society. It itself will provide more angles and perspective for any individuals. But uh, if you are fully equipped and you are growing enough, grown up enough, you should travel outside of nation and meeting with the people from different culture. That's also important. So critical thinking um, to explore the unknown <coughs> territories territories are important for the younger generation. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Critical thinking, also the exploration of what it's like to not have a device for a day and just be immersed in nature, um, be immersed in human eye to eye contact and knowing how to have good um, social dynamics in general is a really important um, mm -hmm. Yeah, very important. What do you think is the role of love in mm -hmm. our world? Mm -hmm. Love is the one of the reasons we survive. We live in this world. So, but there are different levels of love. The small, uh, smaller level or the elementary level is the love that, that uh, driven by the hormones and the biological needs. It's loving uh, your wife, your husband, or your friends, and also. A uh, higher level of love is uh, the curiosity, anxiety of what is happening, uh, the unknown world. Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. is the love yes. uh, driving all the great uh, entrepreneurs like Steve Jobs, yes. great philosophers, and the great thinkers, economists. I believe the reason you're doing this is because of the love to explore unknowns. Yeah. But even greater love the, the, at the top of the pyramid would be the, uh, the long-term uh, interest and the curiosity of uh, the human society, human being. So like a religious love. It's a religious type love. Mm -hmm. So without any, without the require of any feedbacks, just devote yourself to something great. I believe the love, all three levels of love are important, but once, um, without love there, people cannot survive and uh, thrive. But with love, people are able to achieve something great for the human society and for itself. I love it. The love of the unknowns and just uh, whether that unknown be a relationship with the partner or whether that be building something into the world of great value, going mm -hmm. into the chaos and then finding some sort of order and going on this journey of, of developing oneself. I love that. And then what about... Um, do you feel like we uh, have uh, free will? Do you think things are determined? What do you think about that? <sighs> I'm a totally uh, agree with Peter Thiel. So he believes free will. I believe free will. I think people can change and achieve whatever they want, provided there is a great uh, methodology. Of course, Ridalio believes so. So Ridalio. Uh, Pika Theo and Dawi Lee, three great thinkers of, of the world. And you, I believe, Alan. We, four of us, believe that uh, free will is, uh, is achievable. What do you think? Free will, no free will? This is a very complicated question. There's <clears throat> so many variables. Um, it takes a long time to be able to unpack um, uh, many of these variables. Uh, you know, your gut microbiome has been around for billions of years, and that's just older than than you and your cortex um, is. And so it's just, uh, you know, there's that. There's so many other aspects to it. Just like we manipulate uh, Drosophila fruit flies and mice and uh, fish and monkeys and do tests on them, there is very hubristic. It's overly self-confident to think that there's not uh, higher intelligence also uh, doing the same thing to manipulate us. And so there's lots of ways to take this and um, there's lots of variables, but it's, it's, I think it is very good to believe that um, we have some sort of a thing to bring to the world and that we have to wake up and bring that thing to the world every day. I think that's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. Do you think that given the rise of computational power that we may be living in a simulation? <laughs> yeah, prob but, uh, probably there are too many years to go. So the, the people in Silicon Valley, 
they love to think about this uh, future world, very computerized. And, uh, but uh, if you go to, as I said, if you go to the rest of the world, you think, you think the 90 percent of the world need is not uh, virtual reality simulation and uh, singularities. No, they need a clear food. They need uh, maybe 20 cents higher pay rates yeah. per hour. Yeah. So probably there are some very smart people who have frozen their brain and living in a interesting singularity world. But the, the majority, I mean, 90, 90, 90, 99 percent of the people still struggling for improve a little bit their traditional way of living. And that it will last like 2,000 years or maybe 1,900 years. So the singularity and the simulation yeah, yeah. and just a lot of bullshit, crap, <laughs> stupid <laughs> thinking. So there's, there's, a, there's this <clears throat> there's this curve of, of, of ideas right now, let's say, and, and um, a lot of the very edge ideas over here, uh, if they become more about maybe how to improve the lives of 99% of people, <coughs> then we can advance society faster um, sometimes than if you just have this sort of, uh, some people call it like intellectual masturbation around uh, topics around like, Oh, if we're in a simulation, or if we're uh, if we're approaching a singularity, or how many, how long it's going to take for us to to get there. So, I like I like questions like that because they can expand the mind. But I also really like questions that can help a vast majority of people um, increase their living standard around the world. Last question is: What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Most beautiful thing in the world. Oh, wow. I believe Yosemite, Yosemite. I've never been there, but I believe Yosemite. Uh, if you go to my Mac computer, the desktop, the wallpaper would be Yosemite. Most beautiful world, wow. I believe it's uh, a world which a man and woman are equal, and um, people are higher paid, less stressful, everybody go to gym, and uh, no poverty. I think those are my um, utopia. Utopia is my beauty, most beautiful place. Yeah, yeah. And now that, um, let me finish this. And I believe we are approaching to that beauty. Yes. And the beauty is like a rabbit. Whenever you catch it, you you a little bit close to catch it up. So there is a they will jump to a higher distance. There's yes. another beauty. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The constant iteration towards the pinnacle civilization and keep going. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is true. That way, this has been such a fun episode. Thank you for coming on our show. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. Is this a simulation? <laughs> <laughs> I would send my speaker to here. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. just send your speaker. Exactly, yeah. I like that collaboration between us. Let's definitely explore doing that. I'm really mm -hmm. looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. Also, thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below in the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about how we can bring some of the world's top thinkers to different countries around the world, wherever you're watching from. How can you bring some of the world's top thinkers to your country, to where you live, and to help increase the business practices in your countries? Let's get going. Let's bring the world closer together and bring the best ideas around the world like that. <clears throat> what can we say, Alan? You are a thinker as well. Thank you, Dawei. Thank you. Thank you. And for all of those also that want to um, take their best thinkers around the world and bring them to China, go through tashanshi.net, go through chinathinkersbureau.com, go through and get in touch with Dawei, and let's have them come and do a speaking tour in China. So go through, fall through on that. And support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them, help them grow, support us, simulation. You can find all our links below. Patreon, cryptocurrency, PayPal. You can design cool merch and get paid. All those links are below. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace. Bye-bye. Oh, so this is a piece, yeah? Yeah, that's it, brother. Good job. Good job, good job. That was so fun. Really? Yeah. That is beautiful, beautiful tour, yeah. Yeah, that's how we do it. Uh -huh. That's how we do it. That is beautiful. You're that doing a really good job. Yeah, I can, like, we have to collab. We have to figure out how to, how to best collaborate. Mm -hmm.